two, yeah. one, and we are live. How are you, Troy? <laughs> Happy Bitcoin all-time highs. Happy Bitcoin all-time highs. Love it. Happy Bitcoin Love it. all-time highs. It's, Vir- it's virtual high. Christmas. Virtual Boom. high. Boom, Boom baby. Boom. Right? What, waiting, are, what is it? Three years? I wonder how many days is it exactly from you know, the last all-time high? Um, but anyways, it's at least, it's about three years, I think. So it's been a long ride. It has we been. Never, we never lost hope. And, 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 we never and, lost hope. We never lost hope in the, 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 despite seeing our portfolios down like 80%. <laughs> <laughs> if that isn't conviction, I don't know what yeah, it is. Right. So, so anyways, but that's what being a Bitcoiner is about, right? Being a Bitcoiner is about, you know, like buying and holding Bitcoin and never selling no matter what. And, and, and sticking with your convictions, so. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, actually, you know what? Usually I like to start with, uh, where do we meet? Do you even remember? Because, I mean, I feel like it was obviously in Toronto somewhere, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think... Maybe I, one of the events? I left, like, my formal job, like, as an, basically an accountant on Bay Street in the mid, mid-20s, 20s, 20s, mid no mid 2017 and just started attending a networking events and mm. i think me and you sat on a panel at gowlings mm. um and i was working with anti Joria at jacks at the time um, cool something long it, it was three years ago man it was so long ago and so much has changed so yeah it's pretty crazy yeah. it's pretty crazy so um I guess the first kind of, you know, question or whatever I'd like to start with, you know, most mostly it's people are like, oh, well, what's your, give me your background or give me your story. Uh, and then let's talk about the all time highs, which ironically today is the all time high. And mine yeah. is kind of the opposite. It's like, I mean, we could talk about the all time high because today is that day, but yeah. I'm more really curious, like with this show or whatever, or whatever the hell this is. Uh, by the way, I'm on episode, I think this will be 51. Um, and, and my goal is to, well, my, my overall goal is to encourage more people to build on top of Bitcoin or, you know, whatever this new industry is, right? Like to, okay. I think, I think a lot of people I come across, they find it surprising that people are even full time in this space. <laughs> so, so my goal is to, uh, not be the podcast that's like the outsider looking in, but rather more like the insider looking out and, and really helping people, um, you know, figure out like, how are all these people, you know, actually in this industry and like in different ways. So, um, so my first question is, is like, I guess, what's your story? Mm-hmm. Um, and you can start it back wherever you want. Like, I don't know, wherever your yeah, story I mean, begins I'm, for you. I'm like a professionally trained CPA. Um, okay. I'm like accountant. Are you from so Toronto? Or I'm no? from Vancouver. You're from Vancouver. There yeah, you go. I'm like born and raised Vancouver, went to UBC, um, went to business school out there. Um, got my C- my CPA now. Um, so like, I'm, I'm like a chartered accountant. And after all that, I think I was like around 26, 27. I don't think I really understood the monetary system. Mm. And I was working in the junior mining sector, which is a really big sector here in Canada. Right. Um, and I started reading about like just like different commodities. I didn't really know what gold, like the purpose of gold or sound money and that whole narrative. Mm-hmm. And so once I started learning about it, I sort of followed like, you know, the Peter Schiff's and the Mike Maloney's and started reading all these sort of documentaries about gold. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. To me, like gold sounded like complete sense in the sense that like you can't make any more of it, right? And so mm. why wouldn't you use it as money? Like why would you have this sort of fake, sort of like made up um, pieces of paper that are sort of printed endlessly by governments that are reelected every four years, right? <laughs> like you don't you don't have to think very deeply to understand the incentives that governments will always print more money just to get reelected, mm. right? Because they and they print because they can, right? So you need you're supposed to sort of have this like hard monetary system built in to a financial system to prevent this sort of it's not corruption uh, per se but like sort of like an indirect tax on everyone through inflation or just printing money right because of course when you can print money well who chooses how the money is allocated etc etc right so once i understood the concept of sound money i was into gold buying gold and in 2013 um, I learned about Bitcoin and like everyone, like once I heard about it, it was just sort of like on a news article and I didn't really pay much attention to it. I was like, oh, Bitcoin, uh, that's interesting. And so I, I think at the time Bitcoin was trading at 30, 30 or $40. And uh, I just thought it was interesting. And literally like a, a month or two later, um, there was like a big US Senate committee um, evaluating sort of digital currencies 
and they were talking about whether or not they were going to make Bitcoin illegal. And it was like a big deal in 2013 because, as, as you probably remember, Sonny, at the time, everyone was like, the governments will never allow it. That was the big argument at the time. The governments will never allow it. And it's like, okay, so as the conference or sorry, as, as that Senate hearing was um, happening, it became very clear to the observers that they were going to let it, let it pass and basically said, this is an interesting digital innovation. And we are going to sort of let this sort of innovation play out and we're not going to make it illegal. And literally during like the Bitcoin price, like at the beginning of that conference, like through the conference, it was like a two or three hour, you know, meeting just skyrocketed. And Bitcoin literally went up, like, I think it went up 10 X in like a two or three week, per- a very, very short period of time. Mm. Um, so now is that Bitcoin's around thousand dollars a coin. And the first Bitcoin ATM in the whole world that actually opened up in Vancouver. I heard that. So, so I mean, for me, I didn't really know much about Bitcoin. And I was like, I like hopped on the bandwagon and was like, this is going to change the world. This is like digital gold makes sense. Didn't know much about the technology and basically went and like started buying a bunch of Bitcoin off this ATM and out of this ATM. And it's funny because because it was the only one in the world and it just opened up, there was literally a lineup around the block. There was like 50 people waiting in line to, to, to basically buy Bitcoin. I still remember seeing a guy just feeding $100 bills sort of like into this machine. Um, and you'd get like, it'd print out like a little QR code and, and all that type of stuff. And so that, that was like my introduction into, in, into Bitcoin. Of course, you know, like, like most newbies, that entered the Bitcoin cycle, I entered right at the top, right? And, and basically subsequently lost, you know, 75% of the value um, because it turned out to be a blow off top and, and most new people kind of come in at the top and then it sort of cratered and, and it was a three year rebuilding phase. And so for me, that, that's how I got into Bitcoin and, and, and like I never sold any and never lost hope. Interesting, interesting. interesting. Yeah. That, wait, so did you, you did you say you hung on during that dip as well? Like that? I put like at the time or, I, I put like I, I really believed in it, but like yeah. I didn't like put in a lot of time into getting into the ecosystem. If that mm-hmm. makes sense, I was like a passive investor. I was in Vancouver, the blockchain ecosystem. It wasn't like Toronto, like Ethereum. There's all these meetup groups and there's lots going on that didn't exist in Vancouver. There was just a Bitcoin ATM. It was 2013, and and that was it. So uh-huh. I, I never sold any, but for me, it was like, you know, like uh, I've already sort of made my allocation. I believe in this digital gold concept. Like the big thing with Bitcoin is, you know, succinctly the, the value proposition is that you can't make any more of it. Mm. Right. And so, and you can transfer it anywhere in the world immediately. Right. I need to like sum it down to like two, two sentences. That's probably what it'd be for me. And so, yeah, I never sold any and just held and try not to look at it. Because mm. I was down so much money, I just like bought it, like just just don't look at it. Uh, but I I uh, I used like one of those old multi bit wallets and didn't even understand what a private key was, um, and didn't educate myself on the technology until until mm. 2017 when the price started to come back, mm. and that's when I got really really interested in again, and I doubled down. And by that point, the the exchange infrastructure had really improved over those three years. Mm. Um, Gemini had launched. And so there are a lot of really good exchanges, a lot of liquidity and a lot of tools and a, a Quadriga. Oh yeah, oh, Quadriga. <laughs> yeah. Top notch. <laughs> yeah, a really great Canadian trading firm. So yeah. so yeah, basically um I kind of held on and uh didn't look at the price and 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 got really interested again. Like most people, price is the primary indicator of what you're mm. saying. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's the reality. No one's excited when you lose 80%. Um so, so so with this new all-time high, I mean, I, I know, like I said, I always say the price is the least interesting thing about Bitcoin, but I say that more to just like, um, just to be provocative. Um, yeah. But you know, but but the, but but the fact that we did hit it today, what what do you think that means for Bitcoin? Like, what, like, does it mean people are gonna like all the people who bought in at the last time we hit the all-time high, they're gonna take money off the table and we're gonna go back down, or does it mean, I don't know, I don't know, what, what, don't what know. what's are your you a big sense? Believer in in the stock to flow model and Plan B and sort of like the four-year cycle. 
Um, are um, you sure in yeah, that? Or I mean, I've read everything. I mean, okay. uh, as you, you know, I guess, sure. I, I, I yeah, I think it, it makes sense to some extent. Yeah. I mean, not totally. And, and yeah. maybe it's just my lack of, you know, uh, yeah, brain power. But I mean, it, it does. I mean, it, okay, maybe explain it, maybe explain it in layman's terms, like what what you think, like the overall kind of thesis and summary of it is. Well, what I'm a big believer in, I mean, there's a couple models that are startlingly, startlingly accurate. Mm. which is interesting, right? Mm. Like that are just completely sort of numbers that are pulled out of thin air using some assumptions and like the Bitcoin price like tracks it directly, right? Um, and those numbers aren't changed. It's a model and it happens to actually sort of like track it like relatively close, which is the first thing that's very interesting to me. Um, so I can explain like what the stock to flow model is. Um, it's actually just a super simple model that models out the annual production divided by the total supply um, over time, because we know what those numbers are and you get like this interesting step function of a price. But and what I don't, what I don't get, so isn't he insinuating that the limited supply or the function thereof is mm -hmm. what, uh, what makes the, the price of Bitcoin go up? Is, is that kind of what he's trying to say? Which I don't uh, get because it's like, okay, if I create sunny coin tomorrow and I have the same exact schedule, it's not going to do that. <laughs> like, I mean, there's yeah, no because way the demand gonna... the demand isn't there, right? So, so what what is well, that's what you that... say? I'm sure my mom, and my <laughs> wife would disagree. No, I'm but kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. About, the primary criticism about the stock to flow model is this idea, like, well, how can you forecast demand? It doesn't guarantee buyers. That that that's where right? it falls apart yeah. in my brain, and I just don't feel sure. like I get it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that that makes sense, right? But if you think about Bitcoin as a global commodity already. A global mm, mm, mm. utility good. It's already like a virus that's growing, mm. right? So you already. It, it's kind of like um, you know, you're comparing like like Facebook, right? Mm, like mm. you already have utility, you have users. It's growing. Like you mm. can literally model out like the growth rate of Facebook in terms of the number of users, like literally all around the world, until eventually they eat the world, right? Mm. Um, and so like there are certain asset classes that reach that type of economies of scale and growth. Um, now, Michael Saylor will say that the primary indicators are A, $100 billion in market cap, and B, um, there's no clear, there's no clear, clear competitors. So you're like the best in the world, right? So with Facebook, it's like once Facebook reached $100 billion in market cap, and there's no competitors, let's be honest, right? Like you could look at MySpace, it was only a billion dollars in market cap, you know, Facebook was $100 billion, right? There's really no competitors for Facebook at this point. Right, so you can take those two indicators and you begin to. Wait, 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 sorry, the what, what, what indicator was hundred billion? And what was the first one? Hundred billion market cap and yeah. no clear competitors. No so clear Bitcoin competitors. Is the clear got winner. you. Got you. Okay. Or it's okay. use case, right? Like I don't think Ethereum. I think Ethereum is much different than Bitcoin, right? Mm. Um, I think it's going to have a completely different investment thesis and a different utility. And I'm a big supporter of Ethereum. I think it's different. Mm. Um, I think the Vitalik would say it's different. Mm. Um, and so. Like when you, Bitcoin has reached a point in time where is already this virus that's spreading globally. Mm. Therefore, you should be able in theory to somewhat model it out based on its fundamentals and come up with some type of pricing model based on based on its growth rate, right? Got you, got you. Because SunnyCoin so, has no growth rate because it doesn't okay. exist. Because SunnyCoin has no growth rate. It doesn't have a hundred billion dollar market cap economy. and I, I arguably competitive. Reached, the, mm. Sunny coin has not reached the economies of scale where you have hundreds of thousands of actors and it's its own economy. Makes Bitcoin sense. is Thank entirely you. its own economy with literally traders, miners, hodlers, mm. investors, regulators, like it's its own thing now. It's its own ecosystem. Mm. And so that, the, and, and just like Ethereum is its own ecosystem, right? You can make mm. that argument as well. Whereas to me, I don't think any other coin, you could really say, well, it's its own ecosystem with thousands, hundreds of thousands of actors working independently together. Right. And so that, that's that's okay. the difference. And it, um, that's the difference between sort of like su being able to model out sunny coin versus versus Bitcoin, because you're right. Got you. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Hey, a couple of just interesting things that I wanted to maybe rewind back on in terms of what you were saying. So this this thing you were saying about how you had this awakening, if you will, when you started uh -huh. realizing um, what inflation really is, and you kind of zip by a couple of things in, in the sense that you realized how it was, you know, a bit of a, a taxation an invisible mm -hmm. taxation. Um, I, like, I mean, I, I, I get what you mean, but I think most people would find that to be a bit um, 
like of a weird statement because I don't even think most people, first yeah. of all, even know what inflation is. <laughs> and number two, they probably don't even care. And then number three, you know, you know, it just it's just too much of a but it is in my belief as well that one of the most um you know, kind of untalked about things and, and, and is essentially why Bitcoin exists. But curious, like that, 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 that line of thinking, but like what, um, I don't know, kind of like what, what kind of insights there? I mean, you were coming from also, like you said, you did your CPA. Yeah, exactly. Like your, your kind of lens into that. Yeah. That. I try and dumb it down, like super simple. Mm. And so like what, 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 how the traditional sort of like economists, you know, you talk to like Neuro Rabini or or Janet Yellen, they'll be like, well, the inflation rate is 1.5%, right? Um, and really what that means, that it's basically just this sort of basket of goods that the government made up um, uh, to try and gauge how expensive your cost of living is, right? Um, and generally, if you look at that basket of goods, it's like, it, it, it's comprised of sort of like oil, um, like the cost of a tomato, an orange, like, you know, it's this large model of all these different goods that are based on consumption that people use on a daily basis, right? Um, but that's only one component of inflation, right? The other component is this idea of asset inflation, right? That everybody misses, or sorry, that conventional economists miss, right? Um, asset inflation is this idea that when you, you lower interest rates and print more money, that the inflation does not flow into the price of a tomato, that it flows into those assets that actually capture value, such as the price of a house, such as the stock market, such as commodities, right? Because if I make $10 million, I'm not going to, or I can borrow $10 million, I'm not gonna put all that money into 10 tomatoes or 10 barrels of oil. So there are certain asset classes that naturally attract that capital, which are real estate, real estate's at record highs, um, and the stock market also at record highs, right? These are considered two sort of standard um, store of value um, type arguments um, that we've seen huge asset inflation over the past, um, ever, in, in my lifetime, to a point where uh, a, a normal family in Toronto would almost never be able to afford a house. It's, you know, a, a single detached home has gone from probably $500,000, let's say, fifteen. dollars or 20 years ago to you know 2.5 million, right? Or 2 million. And you know, if, if, if it keeps going, that'll be 4 million, right? So if you look at inflation as defined by like, well, I wanna own a house, that's the most important thing to my family. I don't care how much the price of a tomato is, <laughs> right? Um, then, then we've seen huge inflation because now I need to completely downgrade my quality of life by orders of magnitude i.e. perhaps living in a small condo, perhaps moving farther and farther outside the city, or perhaps never even owning anything at all, right? But congratulations, the price of a tomato has only gone up by 1%, so like we don't have inflation, right? And, and this is what central banks, Nero Rubini, Paul Krugman, and, and all these conventional economists ignore, is this, asset, is this idea of asset inflation. Um, and they only mention, um, they only analyze consumer price inflation, which makes no sense. But, but how much of the, the price appreciation, like, so you're saying stocks, um, real estate, all these things are experiencing what you're saying is asset inflation. Mm -hmm. But then what part of that is not attributed to just money printing and just, in, you know, more introduction of fiat, but, but is attributed to the fact that uh, supply and demand, like, you know, and then the fact that people are actually buying Apple products and Tesla products or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, it's getting more and more disconnected. Right. So, so, I mean, you can look and you're supposed to look at, uh, there, there are these traditional valuation, valuation metrics that you can look at for a house. Right. So, so generally, you know, I'm from Vancouver. Um, it's supposed to be three times your income. Right. So if you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, you should be able to buy a house for $300,000 a year. And that metric held true for a really, really long time. Right. Up until about 2000. Right. And then that metric, started to get completely out of whack to a point where it's 10 and even some cases 15 or even 20 times the average income. So the average income is going up, uh, let's say 3% a year, five, you know, if we want to be optimistic, 5% a year, but housing prices are going up 15% a year, year over year, over year, over year, over year on a, a compound annual adjusted rate um, to a point where I think, I think it's pretty clear that uh, uh, 
money printing and debt printing are, are causing huge asset inflation in, in my view. Very interesting. Okay, so I guess back to your story, though. Uh, so what, yeah. what happened? So you, you're a CPA, you learn about Bitcoin, you make a bit of a you take a bit of a position, um, mm-hmm. and then kind of forget about it. And then and then how, what, how does it, uh, I guess, like, come back in your life? Or how do you, you know, I mean, when the price came back, when the price came back, I continued to buy, and just dollar cost averaged in. And it got to a point where I was so excited about this industry. Um, that I, I just wanted to work within it. It also was a very sort of valuable learning lesson for me in learning how to grow your own career, right? Because you know you you really can't grow fast, um, or not. Or I shouldn't say this. Not everyone can grow their career quickly, right? If you work at a big company, big companies aren't set up that way. They're 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 big companies are set up for you to work a role, come into work every day, not get promoted and sort of stay there the rest of your life, earn a salary and that's it, right? So if you wanna grow your career, you have to go into those sort of like highly dynamic, highly disruptive. It's almost like a war zone into startups. Um, Those industries that take on a lot of risk, there's not a lot of structure. Um, That's where all the opportunity is because things are so dynamic and changing. And so um, I I left, you know, my traditional sort of like private equity job um, and, and started just attending networking events and seeing sort of like where I could add value in the space, um, which is how I started my company. Interesting. And so maybe uh, maybe also talk a little bit about Ethereum because you did mention some things there, right? Is in like Bitcoin is kind of in a in a league of its own, right? Which I agree is that it's kind of you know positioned itself as like this digital gold, the safe yeah. haven. Um, a deflationary, whatever you want to call it, open source, decentralized. It started this movement. And we, we, I mean, kind of, I mean, I guess you were in Vancouver, but in Canada, we had a bit of a front row seat, right? To the whole yep. Ethereum yep. show. Uh, just yep. curious, like in terms of, yeah, what was your relationship with the project? Uh, what did you see in it that, that you know, kind of caught your interest and, and yeah, and how did that work out? Yeah, I mean, I think I actually met one of the co-founders of Ethereum, pre-Ethereum online, Anthony Giorgio. Okay. Um, the star, it was working in Bitcoin and he was meeting everyone. And he was really great. We met online, had like a Skype meeting for 15 or 20 minutes and, and uh, I, I did an interview with it. Anthony by the way it's just oh did like, you great. I don't know, like great. a week or two ago yeah, yeah it's oh, pretty good, awesome good. Mm-hmm. okay yeah 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 so I uh I had like a meeting with him and then you know it was it was my own fault because I didn't stick to my convictions and really um I sort of stuck to the conventional thinking around like just kind of work a normal job at a big company um sort of thing and and you know had I pursued that opportunity with with with, with Anthony I would have had much more of a close from front row seat because I was in Vancouver at the time. Um, but I, I didn't invest in Ethereum ICO uh, like a lot of people in Toronto. Um, but I, I, I followed the project a little bit and uh, just, I, I guess I could speak broadly about Ethereum and like what my views are um, uh, relative to Bitcoin. I, I think that Ethereum is highly experimental and that it's, it's like the one thing about Bitcoin that makes sense from from the maximum perspective is that it's it's slow to change and that bitcoin doesn't need to change because you sort of keep your life savings in bitcoin you take out a little bit of what you need right and you don't need all of this sort of like crazy innovation happening on something that's just designed to be a a, a very simple sort of store of value in fact even if you go in and look at the original source code for bitcoin which i haven't done but i've talked to a lot of developers that have they said it's like a very simple almost bug free it's a very simple protocol that like uh, even a simple, uh, a, a new developer could follow, right? Because the, like the more complicated uh, uh, a protocol is, the more likely that things are going to go wrong, right? And so when you add functionality, you introduce risk into the system. And for a global store of value monetary system, that's not what you want, right? You want something that's, that's super, super simple, that doesn't change, um, and then you can just depend on it. And you don't need a ton of um, smart contracting, it's sort of advanced functionality. That's for other platforms. Um, and so I, I think for me, you know, the view on Ethereum is very much that like a lot, all the innovation is happening on Ethereum. I think it's super interesting. Um, I love what's happening in the DeFi space. Um, but I, I think the two are fundamentally different and they, they almost shouldn't be in the same conversation. Yeah. 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 Interesting. That, that, that's a, yeah. that's a, that's a unique uh, take on it. And, and yeah. Hmm. Anyway. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
what, what, what I find a little bit concerning is that like I, I, I've been involved in this at, a, at like a, at a professional level for three or four years now, full time. Mm. What, what I, why I think maximalists are maximalists, that Bitcoin maximalists, maximalists is that like you do see a lot of sort of like new projects raising money from unsophisticated investors um, and then basically doing little to nothing with it. Um, whereas like a lot of, a lot of time, if you're like a new cryptocurrency investor, a lot of people come to me, they'll say, Troy, I created a Coinbase account. I bought some Bitcoin. What other coin should I buy? Right. Mm -hmm. And they'll just go down the list and they'll start buying, um, you know, ditchy bite, um, and all these <laughs> alternative coins. And I think that's fine. I think that's mm -hmm. fine. I think they should have the freedom. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. if you really, really, really know what you're doing, mm -hmm. but the answer is the simplest answer is those types of new investors should not, um, should not be investing in those projects. You should just buy a bunch of Bitcoin um, and then like do nothing with it and sit on it. And in 10 years from now, you'll wake up and have a lot more money or a lot more wealth. Um, but unfortunately, it's a lot, a, a lot of like the ICO market is brand new speculative money with people that have like no business investing in any of these tokens. Um, and, and it's unfortunate because they're actually, I know a lot, a lot of people who got into Bitcoin, sold it all, got into Ethereum, sold it all and got really excited about like these random so projects, like people. Verge, like so many, so and they many. lost like a lot of money. And yeah. of course, all these like digital graveyard. made yeah. a lot. Right. <laughs> and so, and so I think that like, that is like, sort of like my primary sort of like criticism about the space. Um, I think it's unfortunately going to continue. People love all coins. They'll continue to invest in them. I'm saying that's fine. Put five percent of your total allocation. Yeah. So yeah. By the way, I, I yeah, I think I agree with a lot of what you said there. Um, so I was going to say is is that, uh, but do you think that, do you think that uh, that there's a place for responsible entrepreneurs who want to build? lasting projects to have solidity functionality but with bitcoin security yeah <laughs> what you said <laughs> yeah yeah right. like, uh, so have I, you looked I, at rsk have you looked at rootstock or any of these projects like that i'm just I, curious I, like I, no, no I, one really talks about them and it's like i don't know i kind of rsk has done, like a lot of these projects did one thing right which is mm. doing a huge race um, I don't know how much RSK is raised, but I've heard numbers of upwards of a hundred million dollars mm. or something like that. I don't know if it's true. Mm. Um, I, and I'm not, I've never met the founders or anything, so I have no idea. Um, but I mean, I think a lot of these projects are the class example of like raising too much with mm. the proof concepts. Founders are already rich. And there's not a lot of motivation to uh, work really hard when I've made $20 million in three months. Right. Um, type sort of situation. Mm. Um, so, you know, like even Ethereum raised $18 million um, and look what they did with it, you know, relative, and that at the time that was like a huge raise. And then in 2017, there were a lot of projects that raised 50, hundred million dollars mm -hmm. um, and, and, and really haven't done much with it. So mm. uh, uh, I, I think like anything, it's a 98% failure rate for mm. these new projects, mm. right? If you go to Silicon Valley and you look at like the, I don't know if you've seen those graphs of like all the companies that have gotten funded and the ones that are left, it's literally 98% <laughs> that fail. Like you, you, so, so therefore you should put 2% of your capital in them. Right. Mm. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to ramble. Too and, much. and you know what, well, but you know how there are like, but there are these like rules essentially around how, unless you're an accredited investor, you're not allowed mm -hmm. to invest. And then, you know, this is whole kind of takes us into this other yeah. space, but I'm just curious on that front. Um, don't you find it a bit weird though, that, that, that if I wanted to put 20 grand into my friend's startup, that's literally, wow. let's say building Google or some yeah. like yeah. Coinbase type company versus if I wanted to go spend 20 bucks on cheeseburgers and McDonald's, like just pull yeah. up a truck, I'm allowed to do the latter. Like there's no, no law is stopping me. Yeah, Why? Yeah. Is, is, is this a discussion around the creditor investor rules and like, should, should people have the freedom to basically invest in what they want? Well, I, I guess I just find it, yeah, I just like find it all like a little bit interesting and curious and, and just what yeah. your thoughts are on it. Um, so, you know what I mean? I know regulators are struggling with trying to figure out what it means for different countries and whatnot, but I'm um, so, yeah, 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 but just curious, like what your- um, So there's mm -hmm. a fine balance is, is, mm -hmm. is the answer. So, so the first thing is that if you, well, let's, let's just say we, we mean you believe in a free market, 
and and people should be able to invest in what they want, right? Right. Okay. You don't have any creditor investor rules. Mm -hmm. What will happen with, with 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 absolute certainty is that you'll have the best promoters in the world that will raise hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Uh, the, the the project will shutter and they'll do it again and again and again. And people will constantly be stealing money from unsec unsophisticated investors. And these people will lose millions of millions of dollars because it's the art of the sell. Mm. Right? Um, and they, it really is predatory in nature in the sense mm. that um, if I raise a hundred million dollars or $50 million or, or I raise sort of like, or I take someone's life savings mm. and I have no real tangible ability to execute on that, then it's not fraud, right? I didn't mm. disappear with the money and, and, and move to an island, but it's 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 not genuine, and it's I would say it's one sort of one step away from fraud, right? So the best example would be like me. I have an idea. I'm gonna I, I want to go to Mars, right? And so I think that we should go to Mars, and so I'm gonna raise all this money to build a spaceship to go to Mars. Mm. Now that's a really great idea, and I'm really good at selling it. But like, do I really myself? have like the background or expertise or ability to, 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 to execute a project like that the way that Elon could? Well, the answer is no, but there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that would, would, would basically raise a lot of money from unaccredited investors who are unsophisticated and it would get really, really ugly, really fast. That's the, the argument in favor of um, protectionism, right? Then there's the other argument that says, okay, like what happens if like, I, I just don't have a million dollars yet, which I think is like the accredited investor threshold. And like, I mean, how I, I, I'm basically, I, I have a financial system and a regulatory system that doesn't allow me to basically participate in any real meaningful upside, right? And so you have this weird sort of chicken or the egg where I'm constantly working for the man. I can't actually invest in venture, pro in, 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 in venture type projects. And so I sort of stay here. I'm um, a sort of rich get richer type situation. And I actually have the sophistication to, to, to invest in these projects, right? And so I think that the, you know, the answer for me would be uh, a, a balance, right? Um, in terms of uh, you know, having some sort of written test or something that if you really wanna go and, 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 and invest in these startups, then you can sort of write some sort of exam or something and then, and then be added to a list and-, and Interesting. And I've heard that, I've heard that being touted. To me, that makes sense. It's kind of mm. like the Canadian securities course or something. Right. Like we all would, yeah. like, right. Like, you have to be it, it, intelligent enough to know what is a scam and what isn't. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, like the, the on your first point, the thing that, you know, obviously the counter argument of that is, is that like, it, there's a sense of like, we know better than you and we'll protect you kind of like, you know, I mean, with so many, I guess, just regulations and, and whatnot, but yet again, you know, it could be argued that a truck full of cheeseburgers is not so good for you either, right? But, you know, go right ahead. But, um, and, and so so I'm just talking about those asymmetrical situations where, like you said, where you, maybe you're a programmer, maybe you're like a programmer since you're a kid and you're, you know what I mean? You're next to your neighbor's building and you know for a fact that this thing's going to be gold. You're still like kind of not allowed. Um, hey, okay, well, listen. I think, I think theory, yeah. you actually can in Canada, you can, it, it's called the friends and family round. Oh, and so okay. It, it, yeah, yeah, you actually can. Interesting. It's the friends and it's known as like the friends and family round. Like no one's gonna, you know, prosecute someone. Um, you know, if you take five thousand dollars from someone, right? The BCFC right, right. or the OSC is not gonna, right? If if your grandma gives you five thousand dollars or your friend gives you five thousand, but the once ranks, you start taking a million, right? Mm. There are people that will go to a grandma and take all of her life savings nah. and squander all of it. Mm -hmm. Right. That's when, you know, we, we, you know, those people do need to get protected. And, and it's changing too, yeah. right? Like, cause I keep hearing new regs are coming in and new companies are forming around like small amounts, like where you can, you know, maybe you're allowed to put, you know, five grand throughout the year, 10 grand throughout the year. And it's spread out through so many investments or whatever. So I think it's changing. Anyways, dude, I want to, let's just maybe stay back on track. So in terms of your story, where does it yeah. take us next? What do you end up oh, in the Bitcoin space? I put on oh. Okay, and uh, how's that going? By the way, I think, so, yeah, well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not a big advisor, but I think I, I, I uh, played yeah, a bit I of a role. Yeah, I was there. I was there for a year. I mm. think um, I was just uh, I was there for a year and helped build up their financial reporting team and their accounting team. Um, worked very closely with Trevor Caverico, um and uh, worked on like helping out with sort of probably my opinions on sort of like the project and securities tokens um, and the development. But the big thing for me was just like I, I had basically lived through the 2017 sort of like bull rise in the bull market, started my own public company, 
um, taking it public and then jumped to like another CFO role. Um, and so it was just time for me to basically take a break, to mm. be honest. So I, I was there for a year and, and the, the last year I've just basically been focusing on managing my own portfolio. Cool, man. That sounds like fun. I actually did the same thing earlier this year. I took a few months off and uh, just spent time with kids and just did, you know, um, yeah, just spent some time, you know, just chilling. <laughs> Sometimes yeah, that's needed. You can, get, you can get addicted to the work. It's yeah. sort of kind of all you know, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so it's really, really important to be able to kind of take that step back um, after that sort of three or four year building period and take some time off. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, that's what I did. And it's been great. Cool, man. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. Any, uh, I was going to ask you, so in terms of uh, my, my third question is around, uh, like, I don't know, maybe like contrarian beliefs, right? It's like Peter Thiel's famous question. So what yeah. truth do you hold that you think, you know, oh. after having spent so much time in this space, right? That most others learning about Bitcoin, let's, t- let's try and stick to Bitcoin initially. Um, like you said, it's so different from everything else uh, that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on. <laughs> what do I think is true that most Bitcoiners would disagree? Well, I mean, the big one is I think that Ethereum has value, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, yeah. And that, you know, Ethereum has its place in, in the digital currency ecosystem. Um, I, I don't like the tribalism that's going on that even like uh, uh, sort of like really strong institutional investors that push the space forward, push the space forward. Someone like Raul, is that Raul Paul, the, the real vision guy? Um, so he's like coming him. on the show tomorrow. Oh, really? Yeah. Someone like him. No, I'm kidding. The- I'm kidding. Oh, okay. I'm wow. kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> no, yeah. I'll work, I'm working my way up. Okay. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. That's okay. So, but he's been a big supporter of Bitcoin. And then he kind of comes out and says a statement on Twitter, like, yeah, mm. I think there's some innovation going on in Ethereum. Mm-hmm. There is. I mean, it, it's undeniable that there is interesting things ha- happening in Ethereum in the sense that there's like decentralized exchanges and the decentralized lending and all these new protocols that are, that are being launched and all these new tools that are being built. And it's, it's all highly experimental. So I think it's, it's intellectually dishonest to sort of deny that. Um, and so, you know, when Raul Powell comes out and says something like, you know, I think there's, I think Ethereum is interesting. I think there's some innovation there. And then like all the Bitcoin maximalists are mm. constantly attacking him. Um, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, I've talked to some other maximalists, like even five, four or five years later, and they still say that Ethereum is like an outright scam. And they'll say words like it's a scam. And I'm like, well, it, 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 it's not a scam, right? Like, you know, as a scam is, is, is sort of raising capital and then running off with it or raising capital to, you know, build a spaceship to Mars, something so ludicrous, there's no way you could execute on it, right? And you sort of leave your own delusion. Those two categories would be scams. Ethereum is not a scam. They built a lot. <laughs> there's a huge ecosystem and, 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 and community around it. So I think like whatever your opinion is, I, I don't think, I, I think this type of tribalism, maximalism doesn't make a hundred percent sense to me from like an intellectual standpoint. Mm-hmm. Although yeah. I, I mean, from, from an investment standpoint, I think that 95% of one's proceeds should just be in Bitcoin. Like I, I, don't, I, I literally, it should be like literally 95% Bitcoin, like 5% ETH, uh, for, for most people, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. which I think is where the maximalists are coming from. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I mean, what do you that, think? What, what do I think about what? What's the specific what question here? About, like, what do you think about, about like the tribalism mm-hmm. between, between you know, the degree to which hardcore Bitcoin maximalists are so anti-Ethereum to a point where they're almost delusional in denying that Ethereum has actually accomplished a lot? Hmm. It's kind of a big question. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay, so... Ugh, there's a lot to it. Uh, yeah. So okay, so a couple, a couple of just just general points I have. Yeah. So I've I'm in Toronto. I've been you know kind of really close to the people even in the project. I, I interviewed like I said Anthony earlier. Yeah. Um, I have no hard feelings against them or negative things. Now I I, I do think yeah and I and and I am pro innovation. So I think from that perspective, 
I like, why not? Like everyone should be free to try what they want to try. And yeah. I'm not going to tell people that they're not or whatever. So from that perspective, I love it. Um, I was not uh, just like, you know, uh, just for the record, did not get in on the pre-sale, even though I had every opportunity to do so. And yeah. wow. In, from a financial perspective was probably a mistake, <laughs> right? I mean, like straight up, like I could have been, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, so, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm honest about that. Um, but I also don't believe in profit maximizing at the expense of lost sleep. There we go. There, that's probably the best way to say it. So if I had to like put it on a graph, so what do I mean by lost sleep? So when I, when I like, I had a paradigm shift where I see Bitcoin as like a form of money. And to me, mm-hmm. m- solving the money problem yeah. is ginormous. Um, yeah. And the reason I think it's ginormous is because it literally represents one half of every transaction. <laughs> so yeah. how can that be not insanely important so yeah. much so that it should consume, you know, all of my life? So like that... So I, so when they, when, when Bitcoiners fight for, no, we got to keep it decentral and you know what I mean? And we got to keep it like one megabyte. Like when they're trying to do things, I, I kind of see it. I'm like, I see that point. So I see why they don't want to deviate from that path. Um, the general notion of taking, I used to be a financial advisor. So I, I unfortunately or fortunately kind of know the rules and I know how me taking money from my neighbor is not cool. And nor would I want to, if you look at my track record, I've always raised money from like Tim Draper and Barry yeah, Silbert yeah, and yeah, yeah, people yeah. who have, even if God forbid we lost all their money and had to shut shop, you know, which we haven't in eight years, mm-hmm. it still wouldn't like, I wouldn't lose sleep because I know Tim, Tim's going to be okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, so the print, so it's not even about, Oh, I believe in regulation. The principles around just taking money from anybody and everybody scare me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, first off, the fact that Satoshi doesn't exist um, and that Vitalik does, and I kind of said this jokingly, I would never hurt a fly, okay? I don't believe in like harming anyone. Yeah. But just the fact that I could or that somebody else could, that he's a human being that leads the project. And in a, right. if I, when I think of Although Ethereum- I, would argue he doesn't lead the project. Is of course he would, of course he would, right? And, 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 and yeah, and that's Of course he, he would. But in my eye, I like yeah. I see him as this sure. supreme leader. Like I see him as a leader. Like I see like the diamond and then I see his face like right underneath it. It's him. Right. So, so to me, that scares me. Um, I think I also kind of bought into the argument that um, the smart contracts that they build around, uh, you know, open, whatever, sorry, Turing complete is a bit of a red herring and that, you know, that it, 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 it opens up an attack vector in Bitcoin that, that I don't feel comfortable with. So I actually like the side chain thing. In fact, I interviewed uh, yeah. drive chain oh, guy wow. recently. Yeah. I liked that, but it never, it kind of got stuck. So yeah. part of my goal is actually to figure out like, is that can be figured out? Like, that's why I like RSK. I like these yeah. technologies, yeah. but, um, but again, by the way, I'm in the same camp that like, it's like it's Bitcoin really at the base much. security layer and the money layer. And then the idea that you can basically build several layers on top, like lightning and these other layers and experiment up here. Yeah. Uh, I, I, with the look, base layer as Bitcoin makes complete and other sense to me. I'm just Uniswap. saying that's not what Ethereum did, but there's yeah. clearly value being generated. That's not a scam. That's independent yeah. of that thesis, yeah. right? Um, Uniswap. Yeah. Like, I mean, how could I hate on exactly. a decentralized peer-to-peer money. crypto-to-crypto yeah. exchange? How can I hate on the fact that there's no center, that there's no middleman there? Mm-hmm. That's that's that that's legit, right? Um, how can I not? How can I hate on the fact that I I'm kind of fed up with like Twitter and YouTube and all these things being so centralized that yeah. I right. feel like there's again these like god-like creatures. Right? Yeah. But my fear of saying, okay, well, I'll move to Ethereum. Mm-hmm. Now I, I still have a God. <laughs> I don't, I kind of want to work in an environment where that, that supremeness, that leader, that, that hierarchy doesn't exist. And it's more yeah. like truly decentralized in that sense. And there is no head to cut off per se. Sure. Sure. Um, so, 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 so even in terms of building a DEX, which, you know, with Unocoin, we're, you know, we were a centralized exchange. We have been for yeah. many years. Yeah. But before we started this company, we were talking about DEXs and we wanted to build things like that. And we still do. And we think a lot about it. And yeah. And then, and, and, you know, and again, I always worry, even if I'm going to build a business, it's going to be for the next hundred years. And, and I, 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 with the Dow, with, you know, with, with things that have happened with proof of staking, I don't know, like, is it, I hope it works. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not even smart. 
I'm not smart enough. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'll admit it. I'm not smart enough to be like, yeah, it's going to work for sure. Mm -hmm. But to Bitcoin, like I see it, I feel it. I like, it's already improved my life. It's like, you know, like all the public companies are talking about it and it's like, yeah. it's happening. Right. So, but, but I, you know, if for full disclosure at Unicoin, people are able to buy Ethereum, right. They're, they're able to make that choice, but you know, do we see a huge uptake in it? No, it's, it's, you know, 80% of our volume is, is all still Bitcoin. That's, that's great to hear because unfortunately, I think with with every new user that enters, let's say the cryptocurrency investment space mm -hmm, as a mm -hmm. user that's relatively un uneducated about it and they're just, it's their first sort of transaction, first learning. Unfortunately, they buy a little Bitcoin and the next question they say is, what else should I buy, right? And then they literally go down the list on YouTube down a rabbit hole of buying all of these altcoins that have little to no value um, and to them, they view sort of like one stock is the same as another stock. Amazon is the same as buying some other little micro cap company on the TSX Venture Exchange. Well, they're both mm -hmm. stocks. They're mm -hmm. both stocks, right? They're both coins. Yeah. Right? And the answer is, well, no. One is like the global leader in logistics and shipping all around the world, and can, right? And, and the other is just, you know, basically bankrupts and has a slide deck, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that to me, that to me is a, a, a real problem. Um, and I don't, I don't quite know how to solve it because yeah. it basically yeah. just enriches the, the project founders for a lot. Yeah. Of yeah. Yeah. And the ICO thing really rubbed me the wrong way yeah. and how many people got, you know, um, kind of got screwed and, and it was just blatant and it was happening all around me and almost everybody I know was in on it. And so it was just like, that's why if you remember my events, I'd get like tone vase on stage with everyone and be like, yeah. here's the other side of the argument, you know, people. Um, but, but, but anyways, okay. Um, so you answered my question around uh, Bitcoin and the contrarian thinking. What if that, if I ask you that same question again, but kind of outside of our little microcosm, like in the yeah. sense that, you know, just some belief or truth you hold that you think most others today would disagree with you on. Uh, I think alien life exists. Yeah, uh, dude, what? Uh, talk to me about this. I keep seeing this pop up in my feed. What's going on? Aliens are here. No one, like, what? I mean, Where it's are they? No brainer. Like, it's just like, to me, it's just, it's, I, I think. Can you get me an interview? I'll yeah. put them in front of Raul Paul any day. Um, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think, I, I don't know. Well I, said, well, I said alien life exists. I didn't say that they're here. Oh, oh, oh my bad. My bad. I jumped the gun on that one. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Like, so, <laughs> you know, I, I, I watched like a lot of Star Trek growing up. Mm. Uh, specifically Star Trek The Next Generation. Okay. And uh, every one of your listeners should go back and, and now, like, as an adult, watch, like, the Star Trek The Next Generation as an adult <laughs> because as a kid, it was completely sort of, like, completely over my head, right, in terms of, like, all... But now it all makes sense? <laughs> like, That's Star cool. Trek is yeah. the most brilliant TV show in terms mm. of forecasting the future of all time. Like, mm. you know, two or three hundred years from now, people are going to watch Star Trek and be like, it was, like, bang on on almost everything, right? Um... And, and you have this idea of like all these planets. Okay, let's back up. I'll, 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 I'll walk you through my thinking. So let's say 600 years ago, right? Where everyone sort of the sophisticated world lived in Europe, right? Like building a boat and sort of crossing the ocean like that, that, that was considered like this impossible thing and like finding some other land where there could be other people. Those other people, indigenous people are just like aliens. They might as well be aliens. They might as well live on another world. Right, relative to the little world that's happening in Europe, right? Like you live in your little world. Um, and now that we've sort of, you know, all right, have this technology called a boat, now we can cross the river and turns out like, oh, there actually is this sort of, you know, other, other whole, well, they literally called it the new world, <laughs> right? Um, so now, you know, flash forward 600 years and we're here today um, where information travels at the speed of light. Um, I wake up and I can enter a, a, an aluminum can that flies 50 to 60,000 feet above the air. Um, you know what I mean? Like that would be considered impossible, right? I, I'm talking to you over a screen. Um, you know, yet we live, you know, let's say potentially thousands of miles away from each other. But this idea that like leaving the home planet and just creating a space shuttle where you can like move around the universe, it's considered so absurd, right? But it's literally no different than going back 600 years ago and saying, getting on a boat and traveling across the world, that's so absurd, right? Like I'm saying, no, it's not absurd. It's, it, it's probably likely um, that, that we can eventually, what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX, the idea that you colonize Mars, like, yes, we should basically build a spaceship, we should go to Mars and we should try and colonize it. 
but this type of like thinking like speaking about it like it's kind of like an absolute like it's totally normal that's that's highly contrarian and i, I completely disagree with it have you been in a tesla yeah they're great <laughs> <laughs> it's like so that, i want to buy one <laughs> yeah a model x <laughs> model x i was gonna say yeah. i can actually get a model x how do you like it's it so much fun yeah we were gonna get like a model three or something but then i sat inside and i think i was just way too big for it and we've got two little kids and stuff so the x is so much fun we've had it for almost a year and okay. god really, that's like the highlight really of my the best life car on earth it freaking is dude. i know it's... people that have sold lamborghinis and yeah. bought model x's and mm. love the model x more than their lambos um, it is it's like because, bitcoin to tesla and what elon's doing it's kind of like bitcoin it's like it's just oh it's, yeah out there it's out there whether it's spacex or even tesla dude something so simple it's like a car but it's not just a car well, it's a piece of advanced <laughs> technology that's constantly iterating mm. right it's not just a car right it's yeah it's like this transportation vehicle to draw that that's going to drive on its own and do all these things that can update in real time right like you know what i mean so i, I haven't owned a car in almost eight years because i was living downtown and like i hated driving i told my wife i was like we're never we're not buying a car until it drives itself mm-hmm. and then tesla came around and it's like holy shit like okay that came way sooner than we were expecting and this thing actually drives itself i think people don't like quite understand like that that it, that 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 the car actually drives itself <laughs> yeah it's, it's an amazing piece of technology um absolutely love it yeah yeah um hey man uh, another, another actually just on the tesla note have you been following this ai trend that's another thing i try and touch on i know it's not like bitcoin yep. fully uh-huh. but it's just something that i think a lot about i think a lot of people do think about it but have you have you spent many cycles on it and i looked uh, into what elon says Mm-hmm. Um, about in his comments that it's something that we should really pay attention to and that it's not a joke um, for a very, you know, sort of simple, obvious reason that like if, if AI progresses too much, then it becomes smarter than us um, and cannot be controlled because it's smarter than us. And therefore, you know, you, you know, if you want to eliminate all threats to your existence, you, you eliminate basically your taskmasters, which are humans. Right, which is basically what happened in, in, in um, uh, that one movie, The Matrix, right? But our technology has exceeded us, right? And I think that like, that's a real risk and that it's being completely ignored. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, right? And then, yeah, yeah, I think AI is, I think AI is another one of those. At a conceptual level, right? Like, hey, I don't, dude, I, don't know I just, I just got access to uh, OpenAI. Okay. Like their playground or whatever, their beta okay. thing. So I've just been messing around with it. It's okay. pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, I the first question you... I asked it was, uh, "Does God exist?" Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'll make a like a YouTube video about it. Yeah. If you if you, if you listen to Naval Ravikant, who's like one of the forefront sort of philosophical and technological thinkers of our times, like one part venture capitalist and one part philosopher, he's looked into AI a lot and said like, we're nowhere close. Like we're so far out that like, I mean, if you look at like Siri, Siri can't even tell me what the weather is today. Half the time it's like, it's just sitting there, you know? Yeah, or the worst is when you're like, yeah. when you're watching a YouTube video and someone says something and then Siri yeah. gets activated, you're just like, okay, yeah. Exactly, we're really right? Like it, before it was able to compete with the human brain and actually like repair itself and all this stuff, I think it still needs to be told what to do. And it's, it's really, really hard to, to, to self-learn. There, there's but a guy in you ever reach that point. That that's a real risk. Yeah. You've heard of the singularity and all that, right? Yeah. Like the technological. Yeah. Um, but uh, I read a book called uh, AI superpowers by Kai Fu Lee. Okay. I, he worked for Apple on like the voice recognition stuff way back. Like, I don't know, decades ago. He's like right. kind of at the forefront of, um, I think, what was it, Google or like some massive company started Google China. Anyways, he was, um, he talks about it and he says the same thing that you mentioned is, is that there needs to be like four or five major like kind of, you know, breakthroughs, technological kind of AI breakthroughs before <laughs> that could happen. And we're not even close to like one or two of those happening. And so we're pretty far um, away, but, but, it should be basically organized like a regulatory body or a monitoring body. And it should be done by like the Elon Musk, Jack Dorsey, Zuckerberg's and like the technological people that understand this stuff. Mm. Don't, 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 don't leave it up to like, you know, the Canadian or the U S government 
before something really bad happens before before they react because governments are reactive right they're not mm. proactive mm. right um and, and this is very much a technology that can be like invented in the lab right um, um in theory right so i think that this type of like monitoring of the situation should be basically something that it's almost like an sro self-regulatory organizational body where where it's comprised of experts that are funded by people like bill gates to monitor this stuff and keep the data on it because we need the smartest we need the smartest minds of the world monitoring this Mm-mm-mm. um yep. do you think much about ubi like universal basic income I know it sounds like a very socialist thing to bring up, yeah. but I'm I'm not I'm not a communist or socialist. I just I just think yeah. about this because I think it's you know kind Absolutely. of relevant and uh, yeah. and yeah, in an age when AI maybe doesn't become super sentient, but even in oh. a, in, a, in a world where cars drive themselves, I can see mass okay. um, unemployment. So, so yeah, I remember. The, do I like the Yang Gang? <laughs> the Yang Gang, Andrew Yang, Yang Gang. Yeah, he made yeah. it super like mainstream now. Yeah. So so my thoughts on UBI. First thing. We don't, we don't live in a capitalist system, okay? We, we think we do, we don't, right? Government controls our money, right? And we live in a, a, a world of crony capitalism where the government picks winners and losers, right? And we have a monetary system that prints money. Um, those institutions and individuals that are close to the money um, already have assets that appreciate value when more money is created, get richer, and everyone else gets poor, right? So we like we're not we, the argument that this is a little bit of a long winded answer, but but the argument that sort of like we live in this capitalist system is just not true, right? So two thousand in two thousand eight, the bank should just fail, and we'll figure it out, right? You need to have a forest fire to come in, burn those bad players that have basically taken on too much debt, right? Um, and, and and recreate basically a stronger players, right? It, it's sort of like the laws of nature, right? When the government does not allow that to occur. It creates huge misallocations of capital um, within the market, um, further sort of like wine, widening the wealth gap, right? Um, so you know, again, not, not to ramble too much, this idea, like if I own a bank, I take on $100 billion worth of speculative bets, right? If it works, then I make $100 billion. If it doesn't, then I go bankrupt. But, oh, wait, the government bails me out anyways. It doesn't even wipe out my equity. And so like, I'm incentivized to take on excessive amounts of risk. That is crony capitalism at its finest, which is literally exactly what happened in 2008. So, so like we live in a system where the rich are actually rewarded for, for, for engaging this behavior. Um, so let's just take a step back. And then there's UBI. We're like, where, what about the average person, right? Um, you know, if you, if you look at America and what happened just recently with the pandemic, right? Like I, what is it, the stimulus check? Like the average person got $1,200, but like the US government basically printed $4 trillion to buy stocks and bonds. Um, and so what happens when the government buys stocks and bonds? Well, it's a wealth transfer to those people who own stocks and bonds because the price is artificially higher than it should be, right? So it's, it's, it's an indirect bailout, right? Um, so like, you know, where I'm going with this is just to point out the gross inequity that's existing, but that's because of the government, right? The government's picking winners and losers. It's choosing to buy these stocks and prop up the market, right? Um, so that, that moves on to like a UBI. In theory, in a true free market system, right? There should be no bailouts. And the only bailouts is we as a society get an equal amount of money in the form of a stimulus check top down, right? So I, I, think, I think what I've heard is this idea, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's something like the US has printed enough money for $40,000 to get $40,000 to each citizen. So, so rather than bailing out all these companies, imagine if everyone just got forty thousand dollars in checks. Imagine that as a stimulus. Like exactly. Imagine what, like imagine what would that make sense would if you're going to do a stimulus. And that's, fair. <laughs> and that's fair because you're not just bailing out this company, mm. right? You're actually giving everyone a bailout, mm-hmm. right? And so, like, the, it sounds like a socialist idea, but it's actually much more democratic and fair than mm. the system we have now, which allows governments to pick winners and losers. Right. So mm. uh, 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 so that, that's the first piece. The second piece is the problem is if you have too much UBI, then nobody ever does anything. Um, they basically don't ever do any work. They sort of sit around, collect money, and it's sort of like breeds discontent and, and the economy doesn't grow. So so there's like and no one's ever going to like, you know, take on any type of like um, you know, meaningful like sort of labor jobs because they don't have to. 
And so like, it, it also creates like another sort of, uh, uh, another problem in the market, let's say, right? Just like bailing out all these big companies creates a problem in the market, it's created zombie companies and it's, it's basically a wealth transfer to the super rich. So I, I see both sides. Um, I think a UBI solution is much better than a corporate bailout, government picking winners and losers and giving them billions and billions of dollars solution, which is the current system that we live in. Um, uh, and so I, I'd be more in favor, believe it or not, even though I'm, I'm very capitalist and anti-socialist, I, I believe that a, a UBI system would be a better economic stimulus than the current system that we have today. But yeah, it does come I, I, off, and it's not perfect. And it mm. should be closely monitored. Um, it should not just be free money for all um, because that's exactly what will happen. Once I get $1,000, then I vote someone that's going to give me 2,000 and then 3,000, 5,000, then 10,000. And then everyone, and then it's the exact same system we have today where instead of giving trillions of dollars to corporations, I give trillions of dollars to people. And yeah, they turn around and, and spend it on nothing, but you know, it's basically another form of inflation, which is money, mm. right? You sort of spend it because you can create it and it's not real. So, um, which, you know, leads back to Bitcoin, but yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Not at all. No, I'm Is kidding. It interesting <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, dude. It's, it's good. It's good. No, no, I'm yeah. kidding. I, I, I kid. I, I kid. Both, I just see both sides. Yeah. But... Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, a, I think it's like a nuanced and kind of a setup, right? It's like, I mean, I don't think there's like any clear answer per se. I just like to know people's opinions. Uh, what I was going to ask I you though. We're trending towards that though. I mean, yeah, look at what's happening already, right? But uh, I was going to mention, and I always I bring this guy up like all the time, but have you heard of eToro, Yanni? Yeah, this guy yeah, named Yanni. yeah. So Yanni started this thing called Good Dollar, which yeah. is not something that is like done through, let's say, the printing of money per se and through governments, but it's like an open blockchain where anybody on earth can go and download a Good Dollar, the app, and, you know, and... Uh, and essentially claim like a dollar a day of good. Do I don't know if a dollar equates to an actual dollar. I don't think it does. But it, anyways, my point is, I, I'm I, again, I'm for, you know, free market potentially like based solutions that that don't, you know, involve uh, putting a gun to people's head and then taking their money or whatever through inflation. But like, you know, is maybe built into some sort of protocol there. I, 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 I can get with that, you know, and yeah. uh uh, we have a fair distribution of resources sort of like across the economy and that's and, and where it doesn't ha involve any one person picking winners and losers i, I think that's yeah. that's the first universal truth right you don't mm -hmm. have a government or some person that's picking winners and losers they don't pick right yeah, but that's it, what it, causes all these market bubbles and distortions exactly like, right so so like you don't even need a government to do that What's you that? don't even need a government to do that, right? Like as in like like an app, yeah. like a human, like a person or like a, a community yeah. or like you could have something on a blockchain that could potentially do that, right? And and it's pretty clever. Like I know most people will be, uh, will kind of get scared by the fact that what I'm about to say, but they have like this thing where they actually do like a facial scan yeah. and supposedly they don't like store it in some database or whatever, whatever. But 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 what that allows them to do is is at least verify that I haven't claimed, you know, five dollars today that i've you know i've, I've claimed you can use like zero knowledge proofs which is that's what i'm trying to get at yeah where you can yeah. verify using technology but then you don't actually know who it is that's my and point is like that, so right? it's yeah. it, i so i think it's mathematically possible and, and i also yeah. think it's also possible and what nothing that worries me a lot is is like like i love like the whole we were you know yeah, geeking out on tesla and stuff but like if there's like three people or five people in the end of the world like jeff bezos he controls like all these robots doing manufacturing i mean not manufacturing like warehouse whatever he does um stuff and then you've got elon musk like building all the cars my fear would be that all the robots end up just producing wealth for like the five or ten people that run the world and that would get us back to where we all started. And so one thing I do think about is, is like, could there be some sort of like technological open source, like robotics renaissance that's like powered by blockchain, where every robot is like systematically designed to give a portion of its profits, uh, you know, back to, uh, to everyone, like you said, everyone, like even if you're a millionaire, you get your 10, whatever, you know, um, that, that that's more like I've like blogged about it and kind of thought about it. And it's more like, I don't know. It's just something that is more just so, like a uh, um, conversation piece. <laughs> the, the, this is like a fundamental sort of like conservative, you know, theological uh, understand, like theological idea around like the rich getting richer, but we all get richer. 
So, mm. so um, uh, this idea that we want rich people to get rich because we're all getting richer together. And even if like, even if Jeff Bezos is double the amount of wealth that if I'm also double, so if I have a hundred grand went to 200 grand and he went from a hundred billion now have 200 billion, like by definition, we're more unequal because he made way more, but I actually double where I was, mm. right? I'm actually better than where I was. Then that's mm. what matters, right? And this mm. is what, this is what like, you know, like a lot of socialists do not understand is that we're all moving up together, right? Mm. And then the second piece is um, don't forget who's paying all the taxes. If I only have, you know, uh, $100,000 and make another $100,000 in income, and I'm paying 50%, then I'm paying $50,000 in taxes, let's say. If Jeff Bezos makes another $100 billion and gets taxed all the way up, right? And pays another, you know, $50 billion in taxes. But he right? doesn't, right? Like that he doesn't well, well, that's kind of gain he, the he system. Has, because he hasn't actually sold his shares, right? But that's what I'm well, saying, yeah. That's, that's a government policy issue, mm. right? That's not like a, a, a theological issue around, you know, uh, whether mm. or not we should allow this to exist, mm. right? Um, so, so, you know, like, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a capitalist because I think that we all get rich together. And again, this becomes down to government and a governance system. Like, what is the most effective way, A, to manage government resources, right? How do we actually mm. manage, with the resources that we have, how are we managing it, mm. right? And B, you know, how do we, how do we have an effective tax policy that billionaires and rich people pay their fair share, which they want to. It's not, mm. life isn't good for Jeff to be worth a hundred billion dollars and everyone else be living foot to mouth and being one dollar. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. by the way, most of his wealth is all in stock. And it's just that he can maintain control of the company and continue his vision to build mm. more stuff, build more, uh, 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 to build, like, you know, Elon would say, I want to build more spaceships, mm. right? Um, I want to build more Tesla cars that are smarter and better. And now I have the wealth to reinvest and to do that. Right. Mm. Like these guys are not screwed. Well, some of them might be, but the idea they're not screwed McDuck sort of sitting there in their pool of gold, sitting there all day, you know, mm. in their gold. Right. Like, uh, like, like, you know, like, like that, that's not happening. With no, these guys. no. They, and, and they're, and they're they building stuff. A, lot, a number, there's a number next to their name that mm. says they're worth a lot. But what are they doing? It means that they're the best capital allocators in the world. And what are they doing with that capital? Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, I, it worries me when people say tax all these people into oblivion, mm. um, because you're basically by definition are looking at the best capital allocators, mm. the people that, especially when it's self-made wealth that I've done, like added the most value to the world, i.e. Tesla, i.e. Tesla stock, right. Um, who have created basically the greatest car in the world, the cleanest car in the world, it's self-drives, it's intelligent, it's safe, right. <laughs> Literally the best in the world that no one in the whole world could do, right not in the whole world, right? And so you're taking someone who can do that, right? Who's going to take all that money and probably build more, <laughs> like, you know, inventions for our society and saying, no, 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 no. Like we, 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 we as government, we know better than you. We can take your money and we should, you know, spend it all the way that we see fit, which usually leads to some sort of dependency issue where people don't want to do any work. They'll sit there. Um, you pay them $1,000. Now they want two, then they want four, then they want 10, 20, 100, and there's no upper limit because they get used to it because like, I don't, if I'm not incentivized to work, then I won't. Right. And so that, that is the theological argument and in, in how it would play out practically from a society perspective. Cool. Cool. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, when I think about all those guys, like whether it's Jeff or Mark or Elon, like all of them have literally not affected the world, but they've affected my personal life, like Google. Yeah. I mean, you name it, like they have added a tremendous amount of value to my life. Like my kids are literally doing homeschooling through some Google, you know, video conferencing thing to, you know, whether it's like being able to chat my parents on WhatsApp that's owned by Facebook, or, I mean, we can hate on all these guys all we want, but they have added a tremendous amount of value to each individual's life. You know what I mean? Well, I don't, I don't hate on them at all. That's the thing. I, I mm-hmm. celebrate, I celebrate mm-hmm. their wealth. Yeah, I absolutely. I think that's the way to think about I, it. I, I celebrate Elon and what he's doing. Um, very few people remember um, he took every dollar, $180 million or something back when Tesla was bankrupt and like basically kept the company afloat, knowing that there was like in his view, uh, like a 20% chance of it working, right? Um, you know, in order to basically uh, uh, allow the innovation to happen. And well, he put all his certain, PayPal winnings into it as well. I mean, he's gone all in on it, Tesla a few times. But, but it wasn't it wasn't like now when Tesla's doing really good. 
it was back in like 2005 or 2006 when Tesla was doing really bad, mm. right? And so if that person doesn't have $180 million of wealth to invest at all, right? Because you've taken it through taxation, then mm-hmm. there is no Tesla, right? And we're, yeah. back, we're back to where we started with, with, base, with, 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 dirt, with dirty cars, basically, right? Tesla also had a bit of government funding at the beginning too, right? If I'm not mistaken, or like uh, loans took, they, or something, or I don't know. They took government money from mm. during 2008, like everyone else. Because mm. if the government's dumb enough to give you money, then they'll take it. And and, and recently, like, I'm I... just saying, like, well, if everyone's going to take it, I'm going to take it too. But like, they don't need you. <laughs> but I mean, I'm the same. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. The same way. But, did you did you did you follow what happened, Elon, recently? How like this, some lady in California, some politician, just said f off to to Elon, and he literally left. Like now, I think he's living in Texas and working or moving the I operation. No, I didn't know that it was because some politician said that to him. Oh, I, I just kind of put that together. But I mean, there's oh, like okay. tweets on the internet where she's so, literally like, you know, F Elon. And, you know, yeah, Lodo, I think it was because he wanted to work during the whole COVID thing. I think it had something to do with that. And he was, she was like, you know, you're putting so, your people in danger. I don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I think that like what, when you are uh, attacking billionaires who have paid the most taxes, I think, I, I don't know the exact number, the exact numbers, but I, I've seen numbers on the internet, like on the internet, I look. Right. That like, I guess the top, you know, the top 1% owns like, let's say 50% of the world's wealth, like of, of the wealth in California or something, right. Something like that. Right. But they actually pay 50% of all taxes. Like 1% pays 50. Like they're, so, they leave, so, which is what's that? happening. If they leave, which is what's so, happening. So, so before, before you attack these people, they're paying all of the taxes, right. Which, which they're, they're basically, you know, there's an enormous free rider problem, right. With people who the bottom, the bottom, um, the, the, the bottom sort of individuals don't pay any tax and they shouldn't, right? Because they don't have the wealth to pay those tax. And the top 1% pays all the tax, right? Which they should because they have the wealth to pay, right? Mm. But this idea that you should attack the people that are paying all the taxes, right? Um, because they're somehow evil people, which is really, that's the thought process, right? They're evil, they're rich, uh, like they're not paying their fair share, and uh, that's that, that that's the extent of the thought process. It's pretty absurd, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess uh, my fear isn't so much as in like I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, if there's a group, if there's just a handful of people that run all the robots and all the automation, all the innovation, yeah. I could see that being much more susceptible to regulatory capture versus something that was much more open and you know kind well, of blockchain I mean, driven. And so, like in the future, I don't know if I don't know if that even exists, right? I don't know. Well, Maybe Bitcoin well, is that layer. I think what you're talking about, so, so the key challenge here is this idea of monopoly, right? And mm. all monopolies need to be broken up. So you have capitalism unfettered needs to be reined in, okay? So, so the easiest example to understand this is like, I think it's the case of Standard Oil, right? So this idea, there was this one, was it the Rothschilds or whoever it was? Like one guy, he went out, he became a self-made billionaire with a billionaire, you know, by the way, like 120 years ago or whatever it was, is a lot more than a billionaire today. It'd be like a trillionaire. Right. Yeah. One guy, Standard Oil, basically owned all the oil in the U.S. Right. And this was not this is not like the modern economy oil. Where you can just ship oil over from Saudi Arabia. When you own all the oil, you control the entire economy. Right. One guy. Right. Now, you can make the argument as an extreme capitalist and you could say, well, he took on all the risks. He raised the capital. He built the business. How can you extract that back? But at some point, right, when someone owns the entire economy of a, of a specific market, it has to be broken up because, um, it's, it's an unfair advantage and it's, it's, it's not a benefit to our society anymore. Right. I mean, you're but, kind of seeing this play out now with the big tech companies, right? Yes. Yeah. Which, mm-hmm. which, because Facebook is utility good. Facebook is a utility good. It's, it's, it's like, uh, it's like electricity, right? It's, it's, it's what people use to communicate. It's their digital identity online. Um, it's grown all around the world. Right. So, you know, eventually Facebook probably will be regulated like utility good. But what I'm saying is that like mm. capitalism needs, should occur because there is no Facebook without capitalism, but we need really appropriate regulation to ensure that these technologies and these companies, these individuals don't own the entire economy, which is what you mm, just said. But yeah. the strong regulation, that balance is really, really important, right? So you didn't, you didn't, like a socialist would say, well, there should be no oil companies at all, right? And so I'll just like, you know, before I get from zero to one, I'll take all the money and we'll go back at zero again, right? And so there's no, there's no standard oil because no one actually figured out how to actually build this oil infrastructure, mm. right? Uh, 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 the, an efficient capitalist would say, let the best people in the world build the top oil company, build it to be the best in the world, and then regulate it properly that you can't distort the market, right? Um, and then we all benefit, right? And then extreme capitalists 
would say, uh, you know, these people can own the whole world and the rest of us become slaves. Um, because now that you own the whole market, you can basically artificially drive up the price um, in, in order to basically make more money. And that's not right either. Right. And you can so, keep out competitors. Right. I mean, I, I know personally, exactly. I had a friend. I had a bunch of my buddies uh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, I worked with them at a company called Kwanzaa. They remember, or oh, Kickstarter, it still exists. On Kickstarter, they raised like a quarter million dollars to launch a product. It's like a physical product called Ubi, you know, oddly enough. Uh, and it was like this thing that you plugged into your wall. And it was essentially Alexa. It was essentially like your like, Google okay. Home. You could yeah, talk yeah. to it. You can ask it, oh, we'll put on a timer, whatever. Whatever you could do with, you know, kind of Google, you could do with it. And they, uh, you know, they came in, took all their information and just like built it themselves. But I mean, I could have like, I have like millions of examples where, you know what I mean? Like these companies don't even care and they use their platform to get information and use it against people. So I could see how it could it lead to a very, you know, not draconian, but I don't even know what the word is. Like, like a monopoly driven world isn't super positive, but I also have a lot of, you know, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't feel good about like, okay, these people have done something. They've added value to the world. Um, and so now, is, you know, like a group of people are going to come in and be like, tell them what to do. Well, mm, the thing is okay. That, like, the, the only people that are like they haven't harmed like, anyone or I mean physically I guess yeah being the fact that we're having I hope I could build a company that's so large and wins the war so to speak that governments <laughs> are, 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 are are talking about regulating it because it mm. means that I've grown and won the entire world the entire market share right to a point where like I've already been so successful so mm. where, where I'm, I'm just using myself as like a, you know, as a philosophical character, like talk about Zuckerberg, right? It's like, you know, th this is a good problem to have, right? Yeah. Um, because, you know, he's already won the whole war, but at some point, you know, we do need to ask the hard questions about whether or not um, these companies are actually becoming too large um, and imposing based on our individual rights and freedoms and also using, using an unfair competitive advantage so that like almost stopping future innovation because they're just basically stomping it out right mm. which, which facebook is notorious for doing right so like all oh the yeah they basically try and copy the product or buy them out and that was it and he's very like notorious for doing that by the way you know bill gates and microsoft like that's all microsoft was you know like in terms of the whole apple debate like once you get to a certain point you copy or you buy them out or you do whatever you can to kill your competitors so these technology companies um are, are notorious for doing that um you know, yeah. I don't have to say anything other than that they, they, they probably should be regulated. Um, mm. But what I don't want is overregulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always a it's slippery a good slope. To have as well. Hey, you did I, I don't even know I told you. Did I tell you about the stuff that happened in India or did you hear about it in no. March? The the oh, so you know, we had uh, the central the RBI, the central bank in India tried to essentially stop all banking to Bitcoin services like okay. ours. Uh, I think long, I read a headline, yeah. but that was it. Okay. Yeah. Long story short, we uh, the community at large, um, but uh, but you know a lot of the like the Unicoin co-founders along with others, we 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 challenged it in the Supreme Court, and after two long years, uh, we won. And uh, and so now, yeah, now banking is back on, and it's like. Uh, and how are things going on the? Amazing. I could see India and India being because they understand gold. Indians are very smart. They understand gold. This idea of money, I control it myself gold as wealth, like the, 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 you know, the next gap between Bitcoin would probably make sense to them. And they're very technological savvy as well. Biggest gold market, biggest remittance market, probably yeah. the biggest youth market, biggest technological yeah. market. I mean, there's lots of things going for India. Um, but yeah. India does tend to be a bit slow, I think, in terms of like the IT thing. It didn't come right away to India, but when it did, it came in a big way. And I, I have always said, I think big, India will be late to the party, but when they do come, it'll be like, in, you know, an elephant stampede. <laughs> well, it's probably, probably in the next cycle, right? So, you know, the current cycle is going to be very much uh, an institute, a US led institutional cycle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have like, at Unicoin, we have about 1.6 million users on our platform. If that was like in Canada, that would be like one out of every 15 people, obviously. But in India, it's like, like, it's not even significant. It's like a drop in the bucket. Yeah. Like one city, I think, has like, Mumbai is, I think, more populous yeah. than Canada. Um, so we still have a long way to go. Uh, but yeah, maybe the next cycle, I don't know, maybe like five years, 10 years. I, I don't really know. But we're just focused on building, you know, tools, uh, you know, dollar cost averaging, like you mentioned. 
um, I'm a big proponent of and advocate of. Like, I just, I think yeah. that's the best way to kind of totally agree. Totally agree. detach yourself from kind of like the day-to-day -day stress of like, oh, it's up. Oh, it's down. I should buy. I should sell. It's just like, dude, just chill. Like, just, 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 just earn as much money as you can, yeah. uh, spend as least as you can and just put the rest into, you know, uh, something like Bitcoin, Bitcoin or whatever. Bitcoin is a savings vehicle. Hmm? Bitcoin is a savings vehicle. And people should, look, people should look at how much they're earning a month. If you're making a thousand bucks a month, you want to put 50 bucks a month, you know, into Bitcoin, never look at it again and sort of like just auto pay. That is by go. far the, the, the best way to do it. And in 10 years, you'll wake up very happy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not even a big fan of, uh, you know, altcoins, uh, trading platforms. You know, we, we have all these things at Unocoin. We've, we've kind of had to meet the market in terms of like the need. And, and if you don't do that, people don't even come to you. But exactly. we try and always kind of, you know, put it like, front and center that it's just like you know it's really easy to buy and really easy to hold and we want to focus more on bitcoin and you know iterate along those lines it's tough because um there are a lot of users that will ask you to list these coins mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right and so you know when you list a coin you actually drive new 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 users new account openings a trading fees obviously so it doesn't matter whether or not you support or not like it's going to happen so regardless of whether or not i'm actually a big supporter of it um mm -hmm. Like yeah, you know, true, but crypto exchange lists all coins and, and whether or not I'm sure most of the founders are actually maximals, but it, it's kind of out of their control at this point. Well, that's the thing. I think yeah. lo a lot about that. Um, and lately I've been kind of, I, I, I can kind of articulate it. I don't have a word for it, but it, it, so if I had two options right now, right, if I could do like, let's say path A leads for me to uh, earn $10 million 10 years from now. And in the process, I have to screw a thousand people. Like I have to, you know, scam a thousand people. Yeah. And let's say option two is 10 years from now, I have a million dollars in my, in my account, but I only by accident, maybe screw one or two, but by and large, everybody I helped along the way. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is it's a slight long the lines of like sleep maximizing, you know what I mean? So it's not just about profit maximizing. I highly value my sleep. So when I am in debt, when I'm owe people money, when I'm invested in things that are like not decentralized and highly speculative and things that can be inflated away and blah, blah, blah. I don't sleep well at night. So, so lately I've been trying to think of like, not just about like, how do you make money, but like, how do you make money? And at the same time, uh, reduce the amount of harm that you potentially do to others. And then the equation around, okay, well, somebody's taking market share, great, because they're offering the, the cheapest new shit coin that's going to screw people. But fine, take that market lead. So lately, I've been thinking less in terms of like, oh, am I a, a market? Because Uno coin right now isn't. We, we took the path of fighting in court, whereas some others you know, broke the law or yeah. did things that were more subversive. And, and what our lawyers were not cool with us doing some of the things that others have done. And so we, we took the path of, you know, but it cost us a hundred, we had to lay off a hundred people. Now we're hiring them back. Obviously it was just like a yeah. painful experience. Yeah. Anyways, I don't know if that makes sense, but, but, I, but I like the fact that when I talk to, you know, people in the community, like people that are like, you know, media or whatever, whatever, or not media, but like, you know, like people that are kind of like influential in India, yeah. they tell me behind the scenes after like the camera's off, they're like, Sunny, you know, every single exchange in India we get complaints, we get, you know, fraud, we get this, we get that. Mm -hmm. UnoCoin, we've never heard anyone like even like ever complain. Like the, the blue chip, the blue chip uh, exchange in India. So to me that, yeah, the fact that we're not, you know, just kind of seen as like a casino. Oh, I mean, uh, and if I could have it my way, I wouldn't even offer, you know, 30 oh. plus crypto assets is that we do it still because, you know, in, in favor of innovation, but, but it does, it does irk me. <laughs> um, like I said, it, it, it disturbs me a little bit that we are exposing people to, let's say, for example, Ripple. Ripple is, people love Ripple in India. People love and Ripple. you know why? People you know why? No, but you know why? Because people literally think that because it's cheap, that someday it'll be the price of Bitcoin. That's what gets me mad. That's why. Yeah. I'm doing more of these YouTube videos, trying to educate people that like, look, that doesn't mean anything. Like it's, uh, there's so well, many I mean, other factors. I mean, that's, that also sort of like, that's a, what you just said. It's a class example and like articulating a need for like the credit, the credit investor rules, right? It's like, you have unsophisticated people. They, they aren't, they aren't really good investors, let's be honest. Right. Um, they don't really know what they're doing. They, they heard something from their friend. Um, I heard a lot of people were like day trading because the price is cheap. Uh, they just look at the dollar price uh, of something um, and, and they're buying something and they, they, they need to get protected because what will happen is they'll just lose all their money and it'll happen. It'll happen endlessly. 
Yeah. Right? Now there's an argument that says basically you should just let everyone lose their money all the time until the general population basically figures it out. And then no one will invest anything or no unsophisticated investors will invest anything, I guess. And so you have to let that calling happen, but it really just enriches scammers. Yeah. Uh, which, is, yeah. which is unfortunate, which is unfortunate. So yeah, I mean like, well, so BitConnect, it, it, BitConnect was a thing at one point, like, so maybe I should have been listing that. It would have driven volume. But just, I don't know, man. Okay, try listen, I want to be mindful of your time. I think that's all uh, about the time that we had scheduled. So okay. I don't want to be um, taking up more of that. But where do people, I don't know, like if they want to learn more about you, is there like a Twitter <laughs> handle, like LinkedIn? I mean, I would just where follow people- me on the, the Bitcoin Troy on Twitter. The Bitcoin Troy on Twitter. The Bitcoin okay, Troy sorry. on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. I, I share a lot of like sort of like my libertarian views um uh on on the markets and where bitcoin's going um, awesome yeah awesome lovely okay sounds good uh sounds good dude really appreciate it thanks again that was uh, that was really awesome really i'm gonna kill the recording but just hang out for a few seconds here so okay.